I got to ask right out, uh, how important was it to get the best mode on the soundtrack? Oh, so we shot that sequence to that song, having, having uh, the Steadicam guy queue up so right when the lyrics hit, we were in a whip pan to the actor, all just crossing our fingers, crossing our toes, and tying our respective dicks in a knot to see if we could get it. And fortunately, the amazing Trish Holloway, our music supervisor, uh, contacted the band, and they, they did it. They actually brought their rate down because it was well beyond the modest budget we had in order to be part of the film, as of Korn. Uh, Korn is, announces the arrival of this badass, you know, Bauhaus killer. Too. And same with Bauhaus. We actually uh, contacted the band directly rather than the music label, and we're able to get uh, a version of the song that was even better than the one we had access to through iTunes, record bands, anything we could find. So it's, this one, yeah, this one was built with sweat and wishes. Why don't you uh, give everybody a quick rundown on how it started at Dimension as a different film, and then it, you know, you just a little short version. Absolutely. Well, gosh, actually, I'm hand that well, one actually, before that, this started out uh, before Project Greenland. We had this idea of a short film that was like contained with limited characters that could make like a million bucks. Like everyone, you know, everyone has that idea. And so, but this one, uh, it started as a short called Thief. And the idea was like, well, what if a thief broke into the home of a serial killer? Like, what would happen then? And so, it sort of over the years, it sort of evolved into uh, into this, into, into, into this. Uh, and, and we, uh, we originally sold it as a pitch to uh, Fortress Entertainment, who, or Fortress Features, who's, who's up there. <laughs> Tricked them into you know, paying us some money to write it and then have Marcus uh, be the director you know, without any sort of credits. And so uh, we were going to make it for like $4 million, and, uh, and they wanted to get, to get more money because they had like two more money, but Marcus had, didn't have a reel. Yeah, we won Project Greenlight and all that business, but uh, Marcus didn't have a reel. And so we shot a teaser trailer essentially a trailer for the movie before the movie had even been done. It was based on the script, and it was the concept of this guy breaks into this house and, and realizes that a home invasion is going on. And so, uh, so based on that, we sold it to Dimension Films, and it was, uh, it was under the title The Midnight Man. And we shot it not this past February, but the February <laughs> before that in Shreveport, Louisiana, 19 days, $3 million, and we're about, shot about 75% of the movie. Because uh, we just ran our time, ran out of money, and so over the past few, you know, past year and, and a few months, we sort of just had additional these additional uh, photography sessions that were paid pretty much by Marcus, and just picking up little things here and there, you know, a few days here, a few days there, and it was just this epic journey to get to the point where uh, we were done with the movie, and then um, to mention uh, was gonna was. They had, they had a very important shelf in their office they needed to be <laughs> Well, I mean, going to hold that shelf down. So, well, yeah, so Bob Weinstein finally sees it. And we know who are friendly with Bob Weinstein. They, obviously, everyone knows about the Weinstein brothers and all that business. And uh, he called and said, uh, love the movie, but I can't put it out. Because I have all my money, like, in Glorious Bastards, Halloween 2, Piranha 3D. So, like, <laughs> love to put it out, but I don't have the cash right now. So he was kind enough to let us show it around to people. Um, sort of like, I, you know, that in and of itself is pretty rare, right? Well, it's like, it's like Sloan Buck Million. That, that was uh, destined to a DVD shelf until uh, Fox uh, Searchlight came along and, and, and bought it from Warner Brothers and then put it out. So it's the same exact situation where we were allowed for about a week to go show it to people, and this guy, a uh, producer named Mickey Liddell, who he's on at the front, bought it, uh, came in, and at that point we, we didn't have like the the money to get like Depeche Mode and stuff like that. We didn't have that opening credit sequence, which I think really is really establishes the tone of the movie. And so he, he allowed us to go back and uh, shoot some additional stuff, get the music we wanted, get a proper like you know sound mix and, and, and DI and all that business. So it's like we had we we'd taken it to about eighty five percent, and then Mickey Liddell came in and, and got us to the full one hundred. Like you know we're just like uh, with with we we made. Six films. I mean, written. This is the first one that Marcus directed that, you know, that we've done together. And like, without a doubt, this is exactly what I envisioned in my head. And, and it, 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 what a long journey to get there. What it was just. What do you all think of Marcus's uh, directorial skills? The house feels like a mousetrap. You go over this and under, and it's. I mean, you, was it was it intentional that we never really get a point of like it's completely inaccessible? We don't know what part of the house anybody is in. It's all just a clusterfuck. 
And I mean that in a good way. That was a, that was a problem early on, actually. <laughs> Here we could do this, but yeah, it's, uh, it's supposed to be the sensation that if any of you have been in a fender bender and you get into a car accident, uh, everything goes real hot. Your temples start to uh, feel cold, but your hands are hot, and your all your senses turn up. So sometimes you can see things a little better. Sometimes the the smell is a little more harsh, and everything's turned up to you know 15 on your sense scale. It's like, well, gosh, if you were the one person lucky enough to keep your cool in that scenario, how would it be? And so you know, with the orientation these two characters had about the house, the killer, the thief. If that was thrown out the window, because any room, any door that happened to be open could be your instant demise, well, that would be fun to play with. You know, it's, there's a bit of Tex Avery too. Uh, yeah, anything could be the, the, the worst imagined possible outcome uh, with a half inch of wood door frame. <laughs> well, actually, this uh, this was written before um, we had been hired to do the, to the saw jobs. I don't know if people have read on, online and sort of told the story, but uh, when we were looking for a funding partner, we took it to the Twisted Pictures, which do the saw films, and they had done one and two at that point. Three hadn't come out yet. And uh, they, we, they didn't want to partner on this one, but they wanted to perhaps buy it, make this saw four, with, which would have been like a prequel, uh, with the idea that the little girl who got away was John Kramer, and then he grew up in blah, blah, blah. So and that was swapped pretty quickly. Um, but it, based on this, we got the job to write four, five, and six. How much of your uh, posse from Feast was in there? I mean, I saw second unit and stuff. Oh, uh, everybody from Feast was back in action on this one. That John Gulliger helped uh, shoot some material. Tom Gulliger was in it, second unit director, and even played the killer in a, in a few shots, along with Mr. Melton here. Um, uh, let's see, Diane was in the, uh, Mr. Gulliger's uh, uh, wife was in the prologue. Um, and yeah, we and Clue actually recorded a bit of narration for the end credits at one point, but before the narration, uh, you know, we had a loud rock and song to take over that. But every single person was involved. This was shot right after uh, the last Feast movie in Shreveport, Louisiana. So we were all just hanging out there trying to come concoct the next uh, the next production. Well, uh, really, too, uh, when we did the teaser trailer thing. Uh, John shot it. Tom played. Uh, Tom Gilder played the uh, you know Arkin hero. Diane was the woman in the tub, which you, sort of, which you saw uh, in the credit sequence. Um, and Clue played Roy, the heavy. Um, so it, I think the, the idea was to put that that little the teaser trailer, it's like five minutes long, on the DVD. But it's pretty cool, uh, because it's, just, it's all of those people in that. And it was actually shot at that same house that was we used in the opening, so. Just out of curiosity, what exactly was that acidic goo in that one room? Well, that was just based off an idea of napalm. Oh, an agent that could corrode anything if it was left on it long enough, but mostly uh, re reacted to vegetation, tissue, things that uh, were easily, uh, I guess, malleable, things that could melt under extreme heat.